Following years of adventure in the wilderness, Joe Meek has become one of the greatest of the mountain men. But after straying into territory controlled by the Crow tribe, he's become their captive. He's tried to trick his captors into attacking a much larger brigade of trappers. But the leader of the war party has seen through Meek's deception. Come on! You tried to trick me into attacking a camp so large. You think I'm a fool? You are a liar. But I am not. I told you if you lied, that you would die. And now, Joe Meek may be about to take his last breath. Kill the white man. Among the famous frontiersmen of his time, Joe Meek is known for both his dauntless courage <laughs> and his steady good cheer under any circumstances. Joe Meek emerged as one of the most famous of all the mountain men. His adventures and experiences in the far west embody America's westward adventure. Not only because of his accomplishments, but also because of his sort of rollicking good humor. He was one of those outgoing characters that sort of dominated every scene. As Joe Meek comes of age, the fur trade is the driving force behind America's westward expansion. The late 1820s is the prime era of the fur trade. Companies like the Rocky Mountain Fur Company and others. And like so many young men of his generation, Meek decides to seek his fortune on the frontier. By about 1828, he's all of 16 to 18 years old. He's in St. Louis, Missouri, and that becomes a real watershed moment in Meek's life. Joe Meek plans to find his way west by joining a trapping brigade in St. Louis and seeks out William Sublette, then one of the most famous men on the frontier. William Sublette had a wanderlust that led him to turn his gaze westward and seek adventure on the American frontier. But he had a certain degree of business acumen, including a, a shrewd sense of who to partner with. Back that tight, Buck. It's trade cloth. Can't take damn. Tom, should have a hundred weight of nails. But Meek is about to learn that even getting hired for the fur trade is a daunting task in itself. Well, boy. What? Sir, I'm told you're hiring hands to go to the mountains. You look fresh as a new laid egg. Why should I take you? Sir, I've been hunting since this rifle was taller than me. Ain't got no book learning to speak of, but I'm quick to pick things up. Every greenhorn I ever met says the same, and they run at the first sign of trouble. So tell me different. Sir, I just want to see the frontier. Well, there's still new things to be seen. Well, there's places to go that no one's been before. A man to the west. Is that it? I'll just forget whatever nonsense you heard. This is all work, boy. Hard living. Even harder dying. Sounds fine, sir. Almost a lark. Meek probably brings to that interview the right combination of humor and, you know, grim determination. McKay! Where the devil is he? McKay! Enroll this here, boy. Uh... Joseph Meek, sir. And I promise you won't be sorry. I'm sure I won't. But I reckon you might be, boy. Young Meek has passed his first test of manhood, but the challenges of frontier life are just beginning.
William Sublette's leading a supply train to the Rocky Mountains and the annual Trapper's Rendezvous. And Meek is learning that frontier life is far more work than adventure. He'll help load the trains every morning, unload the train every rest. Feed the horses, hobble the horses, stand the night watch, cook the morning meal if you got a hand for it. Keep wood for the fires. He's never been out there, doesn't know anything about trapping, and so he's learning all that stuff from the ground up. Meek's initiation into mountain man life continues when they reach the trapper's rendezvous. They've been apart for a year. They're telling stories. They're bragging. And that's what Joe's exposed to. He gets there and he's going, this is going to be fun. No offense, but looks like you haven't slept under a roof in years. <laughs> no offense taken. In fact, I I take that as a compliment. <laughs> Name is Sykes. Joseph Meek. And it's at his first rendezvous that Meek begins to learn the invaluable art of telling tall tales. Hey. You see a lot of Indians? Look at this scar up here. That's from when I was a whisker away from getting scalped. It's Pawnees. They went for my horse. I plumb fell off, nearly brained myself on a rock. This big old hand grabs my hair and pulls it right hard back. It's a Pawnee warrior standing right over me, scalping knife right there in his hands. So what happened? Shot a hole in his belly with my pistol. <laughs> <laughs> this here scalping knife? It was his. Joe Meek was not just a mountain man. He's a fun guy. He would be the kind of guy to want to sit around the campfire and listen to stories for hours on end. But amid the carnival atmosphere of the rendezvous, Meek discovers that real tension is brewing. <laughs> Listen up, man, there's news. I struck a deal with those rascals at Hudson Bay Company. You'll be glad to know they won't be dogging our steps and undercutting our prices with the Indians this year. <laughs> the other part of the deal is we're ceding the Columbia River to them for the season. So that means all Oregon country's close to us. What does that mean? It means we'll be fighting for our furs this season. You'll be heading to Three Forks after rendezvous. Now that's right, Blackfeet country. The news means Meek's first expedition is headed to one of the most hostile regions of the Western frontier. Ever since the Lewis and Clark expedition and the unfortunate shooting of a Blackfoot warrior by Lewis, the Blackfeet had been the implacable enemies of the trappers who had come into the West. Our Blackfeet felt towards the Americans that there was a threat to the integrity, to the sanctity, the sacred quality of our environment. And we did our best to thin them out. We were very effective guerrilla warriors. I'm not telling you it won't be dangerous because you all know it is. So keep your powder dry, man. You still think this is all a lark, boy? Until now, Meek's first expedition has been an adventure, but it's about to become a struggle to survive. By the fall of 1829, Meek has won enough respect from Sublette to become a hunter for the brigade. Joe, the Greenhorn, is surprised and delighted. This was like a badge of honor for the kid. But while Meek is out on his own, 
he gets his first experience of frontier warfare. He works his way back to where the main camp is. And Sublette's party is getting attacked by Blackfeet. instinct is to join his fellow trappers in battle. But he realizes the Blackfeet stand between him and the camp. He has to make a very difficult choice that I'm going to have to make a go of it on my own. Come on. Come on. His first difficult choice is leaving his mule, which is making too much noise to escape notice by the Blackfeet. Hey, I got to make tracks. Find your way back to camp if you can, OK? but he soon finds himself in a new and worse predicament. He's in this, this big wide west, doesn't know where he is. He's looking out onto just miles and miles and miles of wilderness. He's so overwhelmed by the feeling of aloneness and, and the feeling of, am I gonna make it? Am I gonna get through this? To stay alive, Meek must track down his trapping brigade before the Blackfeet track down him. After Blackfeet warriors ambush his combat, trapper Joe Meek finds himself utterly alone in a forbidding landscape. And now here's this young 19-year-old greenhorn stuck in the wilderness by himself. And he doesn't know where he is or how to get to anywhere. Fearing the Blackfeet warriors he knows are on the prowl, Meek can only hope he'll find his fellow trappers. It's cold. All he's got is that one little blanket. He thinks the Blackfeet still may be around, so he doesn't want to build a fire. He doesn't want to shoot his gun. So he goes two or three days without eating. After three exhausting days, Meek finally gets a little luck. experience shows itself when he forgets he might not be entirely alone on the frontier. Joe, of course, is overjoyed. His compatriots had not forgotten about him. They had sent out search parties, and in fact, they had found him. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes? <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, right. how's it going? Oh. You done all right by yourself. 
<laughs> I reckon some of that green has rubbed off. Old Joe. <laughs> <laughs> For members of Sublette's expedition to refer to Meek as Old Joe, that's really a badge of honor. He's still the kid. He still has a lot to learn, but he's really proved his mettle now. <laughs> By the spring of 1832, Meek is trapping with William Sublette's brother, Milton, who was also a partner of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. You know what you did. Yeah, you know what you did. What's that about, Sykes? Yeah, John Gray's all worked up about some foolery over his daughter. Thinks Milt's done her wrong some ways. Did he? You ask me, John Gray is a scoundrel and a liar. But when Milt Sublette is stabbed during a heated Bro. argument, easy, easy, easy. Meek faces a challenge unlike any he's seen yet. Don't move, you're gonna tear it up worse. Sykes, give me some water. I got a clean bandage here. You dead man, John Gray! Where are those bandages? Hold on, get some pressure there. The trappers managed to stop the bleeding, but Milt's injury is still potentially fatal. If you're severely injured on the frontier in the early 1830s, you're a long way from the care of any professional physician. By now, Meek knows the harsh reality of life and death on the frontier. Here's your rifle, Milt. The trappers have to keep going. We can't all just sit here while Milt dies. It's a real bad piece of luck, Milt. Sorry. Joe. I know. The camp's got to move on. But you stay on with me a few days. I'll either get well enough to march, I'll never march again. Yet the young trapper refuses to let a friend die alone, despite the risk to himself. When Joe first came out, he turned to everybody else to learn, and now he's in a position to give back. I will, Will. I'm gonna talk to the captain. I'll fix us some extra food. Thanks, Joe. You're a good lad. Just right. sit tight, okay? Meek is now responsible for two lives, his own and Milt Sublette's, without any hope of help. For an astonishing 40 days, Joe Meek is Milt's cook, bodyguard, doctor, and companion. Meek was patient, kept a steady supply of food, changed the wounds, provided security, obviously encouragement. <laughs> Meek's good nature and gift for storytelling helped Milt Sublette survive a wound that would have killed most other men. Well, Hulk and I strung up our rifles and we swam the river to see the bear we shot. A real big one. I'm talking old man Grizzly himself. <laughs> <laughs> and Hawk says to me, Joe, I don't think that bear's dead. <laughs> Right back into the water we go. Old man Grizzly chasing after us like it's Noah's flood and we just miss the yard. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Joe kept Sublette's spirits up with his great sense of humor and tall tales and rollicking stories. The things that made Joe Meek famous, that made him such a character in the mountains. After a month, his wound had healed enough that he was gonna be able to go reunite with the Trapping Brigade. But when Meek and Sublette set out in search of their comrades, they quickly run into serious trouble. They come around this bend and here's this big camp of Shoshone's. 
You reckon we can make it past that village if we stay in this gully? I reckon we can try. Right away, the guys that are out watching the horses spot these two trappers. Oh, heck! There's really nowhere to run. They're outnumbered. Your best bet is just to run right into the middle of that Shoshone village and go into the big teepee in the center. That was a medicine lodge. The medicine lodge would be roughly analogous to a church or a chapel, and the sacred nature would probably defuse a lot of hard feelings. Hold on, Joe. Don't get any fool idea. It's just my work if we don't start scrapping him. Here come all the Shoshones inside this teepee, trying to figure out, you know, what do you guys think you're doing? And the trappers aren't saying a word. They're trying their best not to show any fear, showing that bravado. But even if they survive the next five minutes, they have no idea how they'll make it out of the village alive. After taking refuge in a Shoshone medicine lodge, the lives of Joe Meek and Milt Sublet hang in the balance. Meek and Sublette realize that the discussion that's going on is really a discussion about life or death. They're starting to think that it's not going to go well. Everybody that's in that room is saying, we need to take these trappers out. We're going to kill them. Meek and Sublette can do nothing but wait in agonizing suspense as the debate about their life or death goes on. I say we rush these guys. Take a few of them with us. Jump, 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 jump. Hold on. Be still. Just don't. Choke. Meek has never felt more helpless than he does now. There's absolutely nothing he can do, and their lives, of course, are hanging in the balance. Maybe we make a run for it at dark. That ain't stupid. That's exactly what they want us to do. The second we leave this lodge, they'll chop us to bits. They've placed themselves in this situation. It was their only recourse, but now it looks impossible to get out of it. But fortune has yet another twist of fate in store for Joe Meek. Much of the surprise of Sublette and Meek, though, the one that they feared the most, now turned out to be their savior. For reasons Meek will never know, 
the intimidating war chief, Gosha, decides that he and Milt Sublet will live. Well, Joe, you can thank your lucky stars for this one. Unfortunately, because of Gotia, they're able to escape and survive. That experience will shape Meek's attitude for the rest of his life. Joe Meek learned that he didn't want to be in a situation where he was so powerless. He was never going to allow himself to be in such a horrific situation ever again. After six years on the frontier, Joe Meek has grown into a seasoned and skilled mountain man. Joe has worked his way up through the ranks to become a free trapper, which means that now he's totally responsible for himself. And he hooked up with Jim Bridger and his brigade of free trappers. I hate to ask, Joe, but you're the best scout in camp. If you like, I can employ you for the season, so you get regular pay. Uh, thank you, Jim. I'm a free trapper by choice. I'll do a favor for a friend, but I ain't take no order from no boss. Well, you think about it. You could be a partner in a year or two. Partner, is it? <laughs> yeah, keep the green horns alive, check the clerk's books, share every penny I make with the bankers in St. Louis. <laughs> Don't mean no disrespect, Jim. Listen, if I wanted a partner, you'd be my choice. But as long as there's a horizon I ain't crossed yet, I'll be beholden to none. You stay three, four days ahead of us. You turn around right quick. You see the Indians rather fight than trade. Count on me, old friend. Come on. Riding into country controlled by the fearsome Crow tribe, Meek begins the most harrowing ordeal of his life. Two days ride from Bridger's camp, he encounters scouts for a Crow war party. The Crow have been relatively unpredictable virtually from the time Americans came into the mountains. Most of the time, they were friendly. All right, come on, girl. Come on. They tended to take advantage of situations. You find a lone guy out there, we can take care of that one lone guy and nobody has to know it was us. All right, come on, let's go, come on! Suddenly, Joe Meek is racing for his life. move in all around Joe. They got him hemmed in. Give us your gun. Then we won't kill you. Meek has already endured a terrifying experience as a captive of native warriors and vowed never to repeat it. It's a standoff. Who's gonna fire first? But although he lets himself be captured, Joe Meek is already planning his escape. After being chased down by a party of Crow warriors, famed frontiersman Joe Meek faces a stark choice, surrender or die on the spot.
unlock. As Meek has gone uh, through his trapping career, he's learned you never say give up. There's always going to be a way. And that's what he's starting to look for. He's thinking, where's my way? How am I getting out of this? The Crow Chief is called the Bold, and the Bold offers a deal to Joe. I have known the Whites for a long time, and I know them to be great liars deserving of death. But if you tell the truth, you will live. They won't kill him if he tells them where the other trappers are and how many of them there are. What is the name of your captain? My captain is the blanket chief, Jim Bridger. Bridger. <laughs> we know the blanket chief. How many men does he command? The bold wants Meek essentially to betray his own people and work with the crows to kill the mountain men. But if he doesn't, his life will be forfeit. Do not fear. Tell the truth. Meek begins kind of a psychological gambit to outsmart the Crow Chief and save his own life. He has 40 men. 40 men. <laughs> but of course, he's telling a huge lie. Bridger's got 240 men. He's got the Crows way outnumbered. So perhaps if they can get to the trapper camp, me can be saved yet again. We will make them poor. You will live. But they shall die. <laughs> Meek hopes he's tricked the crow into attacking Bridger's camp, but he knows he'll suffer a painful death if his lie is discovered before he escapes. At the end of the third day of travel, Joe Meek runs out of time. The party finally comes over a rise and down below is the trapper encampment. As soon as the bold sees the true size of Bridger's camp, he knows that Joe Meek has been lying to him for days. There's over 200 men down there, and now he knows he, he can't take on 200 men. <laughs> Because of the size of the camp, his own people are now in grave danger. The bold is enraged, of course. You tried to trick me into attacking a camp so large. You think I'm a fool? You are a liar. But I am not. I told you if you lied, that you would die. Meek has only moments to live. Let it be so. Kill the white man. And if he can't turn the tables again, his next breath will be his last. <laughs> Having been captured by the Crow tribe and now caught in a lie about the size of Jim Bridger's brigade. Kill the white man. Joe Meek's death is all but assured. But at the very last moment, fate deals Joe Meek a lucky break yet again. Pete! 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 About that time, the guys that are watching the herd of horses that belong to the trapping brigade, they see what's going on. Pete! Get, get off me! Look! Look! My friends have seen me as your prisoner. If you kill me, the blanket chief won't stop until all of you are dead! The bold is furious that Meek had lied to him. 
This isn't a camp that they're going to be able to take on. And he's now had the tables completely turned, and he's in a desperate situation. But the bold isn't going to let a valuable hostage just walk away scot-free. Go. Speak with your friend. Tell him that I will speak with the blanket chief. Instead, he'll try to ransom Meek for the horses, guns, and powder that Bridger's camp holds in abundance. Hey, Pete! It's old Joe! Don't come up here. Just get the captain and tell him to come up here and see how all this lies. Be quick about it. The horse guard sees them, and Joe is able to say, get Bridger out here. We got to figure this out. The blanket chief will come. I hope you know what you're doing. At this point, Jim Bridger has a pretty high level of confidence that his guys are going to be able to withstand the onslaught of this force that's half their size. But he doesn't want Joe to get hurt either, so he's got to figure that out. You're right, old Joe. I met some new friends. Get to meet them? <laughs> Maybe not just now. I sure would like to get you out of whatever mess this is. It becomes a chess match, you know, trying to figure out how do we work this out. I got an idea. We'll say you smoke with one of these chiefs. I'll bring him right there, down near that hollow. And thinking there's going to be a way. There's going to be a door that opens. They come up with this idea of a parlay. That'll do. Tell the old man I'll parlay if he sends down a chief. Joe Meek trusted the cleverness of Jim Bridger, that they would be able to come up with a plan that could lead to his rescue. Well, the bold realizes that he's going to have to negotiate, but Bridger says that he's not going to just negotiate with anyone. He needs to negotiate with the chief. After careful thought, the bold chooses a daring chief called Little Gun as his emissary. Joe's still wondering, now what's going to happen? You know, because it's out of his hands now. So he just has to kind of watch. Little Gun, the Crow sub-chief, advances toward the Americans. But he's unaware that Bridger has sent several of his men to encircle the area where the meeting is to take place. He's under their guns, and he's captured. Meek, with Bridger's help, has suddenly evened the odds. But he's still not out of the woods yet. We make a trade! You are man for arms! What you say? The bold realizes that he's been had, and now he really has no choice but to engage in serious negotiations. All right, boys, get ready. Joe Meek may finally be on the verge of rescue, unless the rage of his captors explodes into a bloody close quarters battle. three harrowing days as a captive of a Crow war party. Frontiersman Joe Meek is finally on the verge of freedom. 
unless the simmering tension boils over into bloodshed. Ah! I cannot lose a great chief for the scalp of a white dog. like one of those Cold War moments where spies are exchanged on a bridge in the dead of night. This is exactly what's playing out here in this mountain setting. Meek is moments away from safety, unless a trigger-happy trapper or warrior opens fire. But at last, the prisoners are exchanged without violence. Mighty fine to see you, G. Go in peace, Sham Shashposha. Hako. In the end, Joe outsmarted the people that are outsmarting him. And that's the wonderful thing about that whole deal. Good to have you back, old Joe. Uh, it's good to be back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Let's go back to camp. Come on. Jim, I need you to come through. <laughs> what was that he called you? I haven't heard that one before. Oh, uh, Shosh Shoshina, Shoshina. I think it means better liar than the crow. <laughs> How'd you get into this mess, old Joe? Uh, Go on. You know I like a good tale. Ah, uh, Jim is one heck of a story. <laughs> Few other mountain men would ever live as adventurous a life as Joe Meek. Joe Meek may have had a, a few shortcomings when it came to a formal education, but he earned his degree in the life of being a mountain man in the far west in the Rocky Mountains. I think the greatest blessing of all is he had a sense of humor. <laughs> that even in the thick things, you could laugh. He has left a trail of success that says, you know, stick with me, we're gonna be all right. He's looked upon as this really beloved figure who sort of represents the entire experience of Americans in the far west.